the second thing that Orsi asked was to really think about um, what about this whole idea of uh, sea otter restoration. So I asked if we, we I, I'm so pleased that Robert Bailey is here to, to talk to you about that. And I have actually been able to figure out how to get to my notes so I can introduce him properly, unlike uh, our previous speaker. So Bob is the president, uh, board president, of the Alaka Alliance. And the Alaka Alliance, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, was formed by individuals from tribal, nonprofit, and conservation backgrounds with the shared belief in a powerful vision of an Oregon coast 50 years from now where our children and grandchildren coexist, along with a thriving sea otter population and a robust marine ecosystem. And uh, Robert comes with nearly 40 years in coastal and ocean planning and management for the state of Oregon as a coastal program manager at the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. He has also served as a city commissioner for the city of Oregon City, a member of the city of Salem Budget Committee and chair of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. So thank you so much for joining us, Robert. And I am going to turn it over to you if you have slides. Uh, you'd like to share your screen at this point. We'll do the uh, same things as we did before, where we'll list, we'll we'll have Robert share with us, and then we'll open up the chat and do the Q and A. Um, Super. If without further ado, I'll let you uh, take this take the stage. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. <clears throat> so, yeah. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm really happy to be here tonight. I must say that I was, uh, I, I really have stewed ever since you asked me about what it is I wanna to say tonight, whether I just wanna run through my usual presentation on restore, about sea otters and possible restoration and sea otters as a keystone species and all that stuff, or knowing the audience that I've got uh, tonight, should I make it more of a educational tool, uh, tune you guys into, the fact that uh, sea otters are just this amazing integrator of things. So uh, I'm not, I do have a presentation I want to run through. I, I finally decided that I want to talk to you about restoring sea otters to Oregon. But I also have a slide at the end that's, uh, I, I hope will appeal to you as educators. And one of the reasons that I, I want to do that is that I, Right out of college, I taught uh, junior high science for a year or so. And even though I loved the kids, I realized that was not really where I wanted to be. So I, um, I appreciate the work that's gone on. And, and Andy Bedingfield, your uh, presentation and your poster just a bit ago was an absolute inspiration. That's really terrific stuff. And I'm, I'm uh, really happy to see where the, the profession has gone and, and is going, thanks to people like you. But I want to talk to you a little bit about just this whole sea otter thing and um, partly why I'm so excited and enthused about uh, moving it forward. So um, with that, I'm going to, uh, well, let me just back up and say, I got into this because as um, Lisa said, I spent nearly 40 years working on ocean and coastal management for the state of Oregon. And in that process, I uh, met a man named Dave Hatch, a Solets tribal council member who in the late 1990s was promoting the idea of bringing sea otters back to Oregon. And he was talking about it a lot in terms of cultural connections with the, the, the tribes and to some degree, the ecological connection. And I was not really at that time in a position to do much about it. So after I retired a number of years ago, I. Uh, reached out to, to find Dave and uh, find out what was going on with the sea otter business and only to find out he had passed away. But I continued to poke around to find out what was going on with the sea otter uh, initiative he had begun and he had informally called it the Alaka Alliance. And I, talking to other tribal members, people in environmental groups and the various state and federal agencies, um, there was a lot of interest around the idea of restoring sea otters to Oregon, but no one to really push the idea and to be that center of gravity. So uh, a bunch of us together decided to form an organ, reform the Alaka Alliance and uh, see if we can make something happen. So restoring sea otters to Oregon. And I am 
hopeful that, yes, that this little sidebar, I don't know where your sidebar is for your little video thingy. I, I hope it doesn't get in the way too much. So sea otters, they are really cute, but more than that, they are really vital. So let's imagine a species that is widely beloved by people, but it also fuels this vital marine ecosystem as a keystone species, and yet it continues to be threatened by humans. So imagine this species, it lives in the ocean all day, every day, every part of its life function is done in the water. They don't need to come out on land for anything. These little guys are 24 seven, 365 in the ocean with, amazingly enough, no blubber or fat to keep them warm. They, uh, they're a little hot little mammal in a very cold environment. So instead they rely on the insulation of their very dense fur and it's really not the fur per se, it's the air that's trapped in that fur that insulates them. Even so, they do lose heat into the environment and therefore they need to, to ramp up their internal core temperature. And, uh, and that temperature is fueled by the need to eat a third of its weight every day in food. And I'm gonna give you a little video of that. So when you're watching sea otters, you're probably watching the beach because they have incredible warm fur, but they don't have a lot of blubber. So what that means is metabolically, they need to eat a lot. So when you're watching sea otters, they're generally eating or digesting. <laughs> so they're eating or digesting. And in the case of the mother, she has one pup a year. And that pup is totally dependent on the mom for up to nine months uh, after it's born. She does everything. She teaches it how to dive, how to open its food, how to groom itself. She is at the center of its world. And for about four or five months of that, she's lactating in addition to diving and getting food for it. So in essence, the mom is eating for two. And that puts a huge stress on her. Uh, to uh, provide in this environment, not only to keep herself alive, but to keep the pup alive as well. It's a very social species. Uh, they hang out in rafts. There was a raft spotted off uh, the Olympic coast in Washington a couple of years ago during a survey of about 700 animals. And these rafts tend to be segregated by sex. The, the males, uh, hang out by themselves, the older males are on the edge, the females and the pups in their own raft aggregations. So here's a raft, a, a tiny raft. These animals may live uh, in the same cohort their entire lives. They, they may never meet another sea otter that's more than about a mile away. So that's one of the considerations we think about and bringing them to, back to Oregon is how do we account for this social nature of this animal? This species does not migrate. And if food is available, it stays put. That's because of its high metabolic requirements, the fact that uh, swimming uh, an extra distance in search of food or migrating just eats up energy as it were. So, this animal doesn't really move around, even though we see the occasional stray otter on the Oregon coast. Uh, it's been since the late 1800s since this animal has been here, and uh, they don't seem to be coming back on their own and are not likely, on, given the kind of coastline we have, to come back on their own. I just realized my <clears throat> microphone is not where it should be. So we know that this animal shaped the culture of coastal Indians for 10,000 years. And in fact, in many ways, the, it's highly likely that <clears throat> sea otters paved the way for human beings to make the, tr the transit from across the Bering Sea and down the coast of North, west coast of North America <clears throat> through the so-called Kelp Highway. 
So this relationship with coastal Indians <clears throat> went on for more than 10,000 years. But in the mid uh, 1700s, 1740s, its rich fur sparked a global economy. And that economy and the, and the soft uh, gold rush that ensued changed the shape of nations. At one point, Great Britain, Russia, Spain, France, and the United States were vying for the territory along the West Coast and up into Alaska, uh, all because of sea otters. This brought the species nearly to extinction throughout its range. Its enormous daily food intake triggers a complex trophic cascade that allows for kelp forests and ecosystems to flourish. And I'm going to, we're going to take a quick look at that. Sea otter. They prey on clams, abalone, and sea urchin. Without them, small undersea life would overgraze, destroying the kelp forests that feed and protect marine mammals. This ecosystem along our coast that's fueled by the kelp forest uh, also feeds the coastal economy. And so in many respects, sea otters, by promoting uh, a healthy kelp forest and ecosystem, promote a healthy coastal economy as well. But when this species is absent, kelp forests can go missing too, as their prey sea urchins can run amok in, sea, in uh, urchin barrens, mowing down kelp and other macroalgae that uh, provide the basis of this uh, ecosystem. This is a phenomenon we're starting to see along the Oregon coast. Uh, Tom Calvinese, who's on the call, and others in the Port Orford area are dealing with this phenomenon even as we speak. In fact, this photo was taken just off of uh, the port of Port Orford. And when that happens, coastal communities can be affected when the kelp disappears. So the sea otter is all of this and more. It's, it's a cultural icon, a, a cousin, a member of the family for coastal Indian tribes. It's an ecosystem regulator. It's a popular and highly uh, uh, beloved animal uh, with the public. So the sea otter is all of these things. Once upon a time, these animals existed from all the way from Baja, California, uh, in Mexico, what is now called Mexico, along the entire North Pacific Rim, all the way up through Alaska, the Aleutian Island change, uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula, and uh, the northern islands of Japan. The fur otter trade wreaked havoc with that, and only a few remnant populations were left. But those populations of today expanded into um, much of their former range, but not all. And that includes an 800 mile gap now between the animals uh, just north of uh, or on the, the California, central California coast that come as far north as Santa Cruz. And those animals uh, on the Washington coast that are along the Olympic Peninsula. The animals on the Olympic coast, British Columbia, Southeast Alaska have all been, were all reintroduced in the late, uh, late 1960s and early 1970s. The animals in California are from a remnant population that survived uh, the hunting down in the Big Sur coastal area. And today, those animals have, have expanded their range along the, the central California coast and the animals in, in uh, the Olympic Peninsula have expanded their range. But there's about an 800 mile gap in which there are no sea otters. Oregon is in the middle of that gap. So the Alaka Alliance is named for the, the animal itself. Alaka is one of the words uh, Indian people used for this animal, the Chinook uh, tribes and the uh, Klatsop tribe 
used this word and it entered the Chinook trade jargon as Alaka, is the name of the sea otter. So we are an Oregon nonprofit formally organized in 2018, but as I mentioned, it has roots stretching back to the late 1990s. Uh, just quickly, our board of directors is comprised of a lot of people of different uh, backgrounds. Uh, several of the coastal tribes are, are on the board. There's some science people, some attorneys with uh, interests and specialties that can contribute to the organization. And, uh, but all in all, we're, it's a dedicated group and I'm happy to be working with them. As Lisa read earlier, our vision is for an Oregon coast 50 years from now where our children and grandchildren enjoy and benefit from a healthy sea otter population a robust marine ecosystem and a thriving coastal economy. So our strategy is to assess the scientific and economic feasibility of sea otter restoration uh, and to help the region reach consensus on restoration. And that is that it's a, a good idea, something we should move forward on. If we can achieve those two items or feel that we have achieved those two items, then we will proceed with a restoration project in a carefully chosen place or places along the coast. We are not to this third step yet. We, are, we have just begun items one and two. In 2018 and 2019, uh, we held a, did a several things, but one was to hold a status of knowledge scientific symposium in, in Newport. We brought in a, a range of science, uh, scientists in the, and uh, conservation managers in the sea otter world and brought them in. Uh, and I'll give you the link in a minute, but all, all of the videos, the videos of all of those presentations are available on, on our YouTube channel. Likewise, in 2019, we completed a strategic plan with funding from the Meyer Memorial Trust. That strategic plan led to that mission statement, that vision statement I read, and those strategic goals that I just read. In 2021, we've got an ambitious uh, agenda. Uh, we have begun a science-based feasibility study with funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This is going to look at all aspects of whether of the feasibility, the risks, the benefits, the opportunities, and the constraints of bringing sea otters back to Oregon. I'm really happy that that study is being led by one of the top sea otter researchers in the world with more than 30 years of experience working on sea otters in various settings, Dr. Tim Tinker, and he's leading uh, that effort along with the scientific and technical advisory committee that we have convened to help advise him on that. Right now, we're looking for funding for an economic impact assessment. We believe that that's essential too, uh, to assess the economic impact on the various shell fisheries on the coast that may be affected as well as the other economic impacts on communities from ecotourism, nature-based tourism, the non-market ecosystem existence values, and ultimately blue carbon, because we know that kelp uh, sequesters a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and ocean. And if by uh, bringing sea otters back and promoting the restoration of kelp beds, we're contributing to the blue car carbon budget of this uh, planet. So we're hope, hopeful we've got a couple of funding applications out for this economic impact assessment. We're hoping to get it done by the time this, the feasibility study is done. We just completed a new website uh, and have uh, contracted for communications and outreach with uh, John Goodell. John is on the call with us tonight, uh, thanks to funding from the Meyer Memorial Trust. Uh, and I'm gonna give you the website here in just a, a minute. We're also looking to prepare a research plan to support, uh, to help us identify the, the needed research and monitoring uh, to support reintroduction decisions. And we had hoped to hold a sci another science uh, symposium in October of this year, but obviously with COVID, we've bumped it out a year to October of 2021. We may still do something online this fall uh, around the uh, first draft of the feasibility study, but haven't made that decision yet. And of course, we continue to seek long-term funding partners because this is going to take a little while and it's going to take some funding. So and I want to commend to you our media. The website is uh, www.alaka-alliance. Let's see if we can do that. 
And Robert, while you're doing that, I'm just going to have you um, wrap up your last thoughts. So we have some time for Q and A's because I'm sure we'll have folks who would like to. Okay, ask. sure. So this is our this is our website. Uh, we've just completed it. I'm really thrilled with it. We've tried to make it uh, rich with a lot of content you can go to. So um, let's see. I'm going back to. Uh, where are we here? We can still see your slide. There we are. So we've got Facebook. Check us out on Facebook. The YouTube channel uh, also has all of the, uh, as I said, all of the uh, speakers from our symposium from two years ago. And these are really terrific, informative uh, presentations. I, I commend those to you. So, uh, and then John uh, Goodell and, and uh, the Oregon Wildlife Foundation have produced a series of podcasts with some of the, the leading people in our sea otter, kelp, and science world. So those are available for you too. So uh, with that, I want to say thanks for caring. And I want to show you one more slide. And this is not in my show, but I decided I needed to show it. This is where I started from. This is what I, the, the uh, graphic I st was starting from. And uh, I just want to show it to you because I started thinking about sea otters as an integrator across all of these interests, all these topics, all these issues. And for those of you who are uh, educators, I can't think of a more attractive way to introduce your students to self-learning down a number of these pathways than through the, the topic of the sea otters. So that's it. I'm done. Thank you so much, Robert. I'm going to open it up now for the chat for questions. Uh, so if you have one, go ahead and place in the chat or if you just, um, I'll, let, I'll be quiet here for a moment, give people time to process. So let's, uh, let's get off my screen if we can. Now, if you can stop your screen, that would be awesome. Let's see. I just let's stopped see. it. Thank you, Kate. Beats the socks off of me. Uh, I have a question on your website and I, I know I'm capable of going and looking at it. And if you talked about it, I apologize if I missed it. Um, would there be like lesson plan examples or things that we could do to share with uh, students or families? We're looking at putting together some family summer school packets of things they could explore together, especially for our Indian education students in our title six program. And this seems very fitting um, where you already have tribal support that is um, deeply embedded into this work. So I just was wondering if there's a way to partner with that aspect. Boy, we'd love to do it. John, you got any ideas? But I, I, we don't have any curriculum right now or any, any packages like that. But I, I, as I say, I can totally see how uh, those packages could be constructed. I just, it's yeah, just I, such right. So, so I would right put my email. Things. Pardon me? Yeah, I'll put my email in the chat, and if you, if we could get together on, um, okay. we're meeting with Salem Kaiser week on. They're looking at the same avenue of how we can do some of these summer school packages for families. I would love to work with you on it, and we can partner. It looks like Chris is into it too, so um, I'll put that in there, and if you connect, okay. that'd be awesome. Yeah, John Goodell is uh, our our guy working on communications and outreach and education. So, uh, and he's had some experience working with STEM right. hubs before so awesome we super we have time for another question if there is one more question thanks miley's there's one in the chat box what is there i'm not oh, seeing it, so i missed it um oh yes mickey i'm so sorry it just came up for me must have a delay oh the question about could you see any opportunity for students to do citizen science type work with the alliance at this point, you know, I've, I've racked my brain about that. John and I have talked a bit about citizen science and how we can fold that into this. I personally am at a loss at this stage of the game, this early on. But down the road, absolutely. Um, so that's all I can say. I actually think that would be really great too. Um, living near the coast, many of our seniors, in order to graduate, they have to do community service projects. And I would love for them to be able to be doing things that are more hands-on uh -huh. um, and integrated into science. Uh -huh. 
So if you ever come up with anything like that or you need help developing yeah. something like that, I would be willing to help with that. Well, the, just the, one of the things that pops to mind, and I don't know how citizen science this is, but one of the things that's begun to motivate us about, or has really motivated us recently, is re receiving anecdotal reports from fishermen and others about the absence of kelp along the coast, where, where kelp is normally seen. And I don't know what kinds of observations, because for most people, our, our closest approach to kelp is when it washes up on the beach after a storm. But uh, things like that, the, the observational uh, aspects of all of this are could be could be really important. Well, I want to thank you so much we can... for that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tom. I don't want to interrupt. Oh, sorry. I was just mentioning. John, sorry, it was John. Go ahead, John. Yeah. No problem. One, one thing we can do, uh, I think Bob and I can, there's so many partners involved with this initiative, California to BC to Alaska. Um, have a really multi-dimensional approach to sea otters and kelp uh, conservation. I'm particularly, we were just talking about the high why um, area and how, I think because I am sure they have some fairly um, developed uh, programs with, with, you know, school groups and, and curriculum that we could probably touch, touch base with you again after we've done a little bit more homework. Good. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Robert. Really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for the opportunity, everybody.